So we've been considering this weekend, envisioning the kingdom. We considered how that when we go out on, on an evening or on the night and we look up to the sky above us and we see the stars there shining, that they remind us that the promises to Abraham stand fast, that God's purpose with this earth shall be accomplished. His kingdom will come and that is a certainty. The only question is whether or not we are going to be there to behold these things and to have a part in these things. We've considered how one day everything is going to change when there comes that knock on the door and will be taken away, gathered unto our Lord. And if it is found in that day that we have dedicated our life to our God, that we have lived by faith, striving always to put him first in our lives, that in his, in his grace and in his mercy, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be immortalized, filled with spirit, filled with life, ready to go forth, bursting with energy. We might go with our Lord to establish the kingdom of God, to shatter to pieces the kingdom of men and to replace it with a righteous reign. And so we will go forth from the sands of Sinai and make our way up to Jerusalem, that we might establish the capital of our new kingdom or of the restored kingdom of Israel, once again back in the earth, that we might reign with Christ for a thousand years as kings and priests with that great purpose of the thousand years as we've seen to bring all things under the feet of the multitudinous Christ as we are teaching the nations that they too might have that hope of eternal life. And yet, we read in our daily reading, Psalm 90, and in verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. And so the thousand years will soon pass. In God's sight it's but as yesterday. That time will be truly wonderful, truly glorious, exceeding magnificent. There'll be so much work to do. How wonderful to watch the mortals' eyes light up as they understand, to see them progressing, to see them developing and becoming closer to that character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it will soon pass. The thousand years will come to an end. And what then? By that time it will be immortal. A thousand years will perhaps, in a sense, seem quite a short time. And so now we come to consider then cometh the end. And so we saw in our reading at the end of Revelation 19, we read of how the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gather together in verse 19 to make war against him that sat on the horse, which we believe to be the Lord Jesus Christ. That they're actually going to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ. Almost unbelievable, and yet when we consider how they put the Son of God to death, we are perhaps not so surprised. And yet, as we've considered over the weekend, all the rebellion will be crushed. The nations will be brought in subjection to their new king. And so in verse 20 of Revelation 19, we see the beast and the false prophet, they are destroyed. They are cast into that lake of fire. So that the nations might be subdued to their new king. As we've considered, they're going to be humbled and brought to that state in which they'll actually be ready to learn of God, that they might become teachable, that God might be able to work with them and give them the hope of eternal life also, that they might be able to develop his character. And so we come to Revelation and chapter 20. And the first thing we're going to look at here is this idea of the thousand years. And so I'm just going to share the screen now and you'll be able to see our PowerPoint. How we are considering then cometh the end. And we've just read through Revelation 20 and we've read several times of the thousand years. And so it's perhaps now an appropriate time to consider how the kingdom 
reign of the Lord Jesus Christ over the mortal population does in fact last for a thousand years. We've not yet proved this, we've just stated it. And so it's appropriate to consider this now because I think this is perhaps the only chapter in the Bible which explicitly tells us the reign will be for 1,000 years. And this would lead some to question, well, we know that the book of Revelation, it's a book of sign and symbol. We don't always take the time periods as literal, just take them as read. So do we take the thousand years as a literal thousand years? Well, we do this, and this is some of the reasons perhaps why. So this time period is quite unique in that you'll see we read it at the end of verse 2, again in verse 3, again the end of verse 4, again verse 5, again the end of verse 6, again in verse 7. And so we see six consecutive verses explicitly mentioned a thousand years. We've been told again and again it's a thousand years. This perhaps doesn't seem to be like some of the other concealed time periods. And in fact, it's a time period that is after Christ's return. So the book of Revelation is concealed, that only the, the faithful, those who really humble themselves before God's word, that they will be the ones that understand. And so many others that come to this book will just not have a clue what it talks about. But perhaps this time period doesn't need to be concealed in the same way, because after the Lord Jesus Christ has returned, this thousand year reign will be established. And presumably everyone will know that it's going to last for a thousand years. It also fits neatly with the idea of the seven thousand year plan. We know from Peter how a, a day is as a thousand years. And we consider creation, that creation took six days, but then on the seventh, the Sabbath day, God rested. And Hebrews 4 tells us that that Sabbath day is pointing forward to the Sabbath day of rest, the millennial reign, we believe. And so it fits, doesn't it, that there's been around 6,000 years of history since Adam and Eve. And we're expecting the Lord's return could be imminent and then there'll be that seventh thousand year, the reign of the kingdom of God. It also fits with the finesse of the idea. Because the alternative, if we were to take this as a symbolic time period, like the rest in the book of Revelation, well, we always apply the day for a year principle. And so we'd have to say that a thousand years actually represents 360,000 years. And so we'd say we've had 6,000 years since creation as things are currently, and then we'll have 360,000 years of the kingdom, and then we'll come the end. And we've seen that the purpose of the thousand years is to bring out a multitude which shall glorify God. We see it as the saints of the first fruits, and those who lived during the thousand years, they are the the harvest whole, the crop which are going to be taken out, that at the end of the thousand years, the earth might be filled with people glorifying God. And so a thousand years perhaps makes more sense than 360,000 years, especially as we consider that there is a connection between the pre and the post-millennial events, as we're going to see during this class. And if they were separated by such a massive time period, surely by then there'd be barely any connection. It'd be generations and generations and generations later. Whereas in reality, if it's only just over a thousand years connecting these events, when we consider that people will be living for hundreds of years, some of them might be almost living for a thousand years. The events after the millennium will actually be only a few generations from the events before the millennium. And these events are connected as we shall see. And so we do believe that it will in fact be a literal thousand years reign, as it says at the end of verse six of Revelation 20. It talks about reigning for a thousand years, reigning with Christ as kings and priests. And so it's going to be a thousand years reign once the kingdoms of this world have been subdued to the Lord Jesus Christ. A thousand years for which Satan is going to be bound. And so we're going to move on now to consider this symbol. We've come a few times to the, the book of Revelation during the course of the weekend, and hopefully we begin to see that although this is a difficult book, and it does take time and careful consideration, that these things aren't even beyond us as young people, that we can unlock the secrets that we present with many pictures which contain so much glorious details 
And we can understand these pictures when we begin to compare scripture with scripture. And so the picture presented before us in Revelation 20, it's that of an angel with this great chain and he lays hold on this dragon and he binds him for a thousand years. What could this represent to us? We're just looking at it in a very simplistic way. We have this dragon is described in verse two also as that old serpent and is called the devil and is called Satan. And so I'm sure we, we expect that this is some sort of negative thing. It's not a good dragon. And so binding the dragon is probably a good thing. And so this dragon is bound and as a result, he's going to deceive the nations no more in verse three. So what might this represent? Well, we've already considered this weekend what the serpent represents. It's specifically called here that old serpent. It's like it's taking our minds all the way back to Genesis three, that old serpent. And we've considered how it's in Genesis three that sin is introduced to the world. And so that serpent has that link to sin. And so just in a very simple way, we see that this is a symbol which is somehow connected to sin. And I'm sure we'd also associate devil and Satan, those words also with sin and the false accuser and the adversary. And so if this is sin being bound in some form, then it's in a sense, it's sin being restrained. If deception is no more, well then that means instead the truth is triumphant. And so we're very simply able to unlock this just by considering in Genesis 3 that this in some fashion is representing to us, we believe, sin being restrained and instead the truth being triumphant. And that fits with what we've just seen, the end of verse 6, that here's the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints reigning for a thousand years. As we've already considered earlier, that this is going to be a time when the truth goes forth, when the nations are taught about God. And further to this, the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints will be bringing righteous judgment. Thou be the ones who are in control. And like we said, when Peter was faced with Ananias and Sapphira, he knew when they were lying. The saints will be there in spirit power. They'll be able to keep effective law and order. And they will also be teaching the world of righteousness. And so although the mortal population will still sin, there will be greatly reduced sin. And also as a result of these things, there'll be a great peace and reduced death. And so we begin to see that this is a, a symbol of sin being restrained. And like during the setting up of the thousand years, when the nations will be fighting against Christ, sin will no longer be there in the military. There will no longer be these uprising. They shall learn war no more. And like that time period before Christ return, there will no longer be sin present in the rulers of the nations. At the moment, all of the rulers of the nations, they are all sinners themselves. They are all corrupt after some fashion. Whereas in the thousand years, Christ and the saints, they shall reign as sinless immortals. And so in a sense, sin will have been cast down. No longer in the, the heavens, the spiritual heavens, we're, we're talking about the rulers of that age sin will be confined to the common people where they still will have to struggle against sin there still will be sin in the earth but it will be greatly reduced and so if this is what is represented by the dragon being bound if we've understood this then what does it mean when the dragon is loosed Or well, just one further cross-reference too, we see in Daniel chapter 7, which perhaps confirms what we've seen seems to be correct, because Daniel 7 speaks of similar things when he represents the kingdoms of men as four beasts. And in Daniel 7, we read that the fourth beast is destroyed, whereas the other three beasts, they have their lives prolonged for a season and time, and yet their dominion is taken away. And so during the thousand years, there still will be nations, but they will have no dominion. The Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, they will be the rulers. The nations will be the subjects who will have that opportunity to learn of God. 
And so now we come to consider the reverse of this when the dragon is loosed. And so this is sin unrestrained. This means deception now abounds. We see in verse seven, Satan's loosed, verse eight, he goes out to deceive the nations. Sin is unrestrained, deception abounds, and as a result of this, rebellion builds up. And the nations in the four quarters of the earth, they are gathered together to battle. And so we see it's the opposite of what happens at the beginning of the thousand years. That there's this unloosing and this rebellion, the final rebellion that's ever going to build. We're going to be considering this rebellion now and to introduce us to it, we just want to consider the, the wonderful symmetry that we find presented to us. So if you note in verse 8, when this rebellion takes place, it's specifically connected to these two names, Gog and Magog. And so those two names are, of course, taking us straight back to Ezekiel chapter 38. It's reminding us of the events of Ezekiel 38, and when we read of those two names, Gog and Magog. And there's a, there's a wonderful symmetry, what we find here, because we find shortly before the thousand years begins, that Gog of the land of Magog in Ezekiel 38, he invades the land of Israel. And here we find in Revelation 20, that a little season after the thousand years, Gog and Magog, they compass the beloved city, which we would expect to be Jerusalem. And so it's exactly the same idea. In fact, the symmetry builds further. We've already considered how the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place before the battle of Armageddon, when Gog and the nations which have been gathered together are going to be judged. The judgment seat would take place before then. Whereas after the little season, the final thing will be the final judgment. And so there's a beautiful symmetry here. It's like a chiasm with a thousand years in the center. And this perhaps gives us an idea of how long that little season might last for. We can't be sure, but if we believe it's around 50 years from the judgment seat until the establishment of the thousand years, and then it's about in 10 years later, perhaps, when the Battle of Armageddon takes place, about 40 years before the thousand years begins. This perhaps indicates to us that the little season could be a period of around 40 to 50 years, which is our best guess at the sort of time period that we're talking about for this rebellion period after the thousand years. But what we're clearly seeing is that there's a symmetry and there's this parallel between the great battle that takes place before the thousand years and this great battle that's being gathered together after the thousand years. And so how will this work? How can it be that there's this rebellion when the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints are in control? Well, the implication would appear to be that the saints have withdrawn they're no longer scattered over the earth, perhaps each looking after ten cities or five cities or one city, keeping that law and order and control and teaching the nations. Perhaps they have been regathered to one location. Because in verse 9, when the army comes up, it says it come past the camp of the saints about. And so the implication is the saints are there in one camp. They've been gathered together. Why might this be the case? Well, perhaps this is the same as in 2 Chronicles 32. In that chapter, we read about King Hezekiah and how in the business of the ambassadors, the princes of Babylon, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. And so God left Hezekiah to try him. That word I think it's the word left. It's, it's actually the same Hebrew word as in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Hezekiah was forsaken or left that God might try him and see all that is in his heart. And for a thousand years, the nations, they have been subject to Christ and the saints. And so it's perhaps not so surprising if they appear to be model citizens. But if the saints withdraw, we then we get to get to see what's really 
in their hearts. And so this will probably be the time of testing for those who have lived during the thousand years. Yeah, more than this, we know that it's through much tribulation that we enter into the kingdom of God. And that tribulation helps to refine our characters. And these people, they've had the blessing of living through the kingdom. But if they're going to have that hope of immortal life, perhaps this will be their time of tribulation, of testing, whether or not they join this rebellion, the things that they might suffer at the hands of the rebellion if they don't. And so a time of great testing for the peoples of the earth. And so the saints withdraw and then momentum begins to build because we see in verse 8 that it's the nations in the four quarters of the earth. The implication seems to be the whole earth and they become as the number as the sand of the sea. There's that many in this great multitude. How tragic it, it is. The sand of the sea, it reminds us of the promises to Abraham. These are those people who have lived under the blessings of the fulfilled promises to Abraham. And yet they are rebelling. And so how will this work? Well, we've already seen that it's specifically connected to Gog and Magog. So perhaps it is that the rebellion may even start with the descendants of Gog. We see that during the thousand years that the nations, they, they come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They go up to the temple to learn of the ways of God. And as they make their way up on the highway, Shortly before they, they cross over the Jordan into the land, thou come up to the monument of Haman Gog, the burial place of Gog's army. Thou be reminded of the end of rebellion, the end of all flesh. There'll be a witness to them of the battle of Armageddon and of how Gog's army was crushed before the thousand years began. And that should be a warning to them. But perhaps for some that instead view that with resentment. That might to them be a reminder that their nation, they were so close to taking over the world. It almost appeared as if they were there and then they suddenly this new force came on the scene. And it might be a reminder of how close they were to ruling themselves and ruling the earth. Perhaps they'll view it with resentment. Perhaps they'll look back at the days before the thousand years began when man kind of ruled himself and they forget how much worse things were. And they'll kind of look back on that in fondness and want to seek to reestablish that, to assert themselves. If the saints have now withdrawn, you can imagine how people will slowly start to be able to get away with things. They do something they've never been able to do before because the saints have stopped them. They get away with a small crime here and there. And when they're not punished, that begins to build. They push it a bit further and a bit further. There's these secret meetings as people are talking about going up and making themselves rulers. And these secret meetings become more and more open. They get bolder and bolder when they're not opposed, when they're not repressed. And so this rebellion begins to generate more and more. It begins to grow until it becomes as the sand upon the seashore how sad it is so many are going to join this and they get that bold that they come up against the beloved city and so ultimately then we see this rebellion is going to be crushed and so revelation 20 verse 9 they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from god out of heaven and devoured them. When this fire comes down, this is the book of Revelation, so perhaps it's not just literally that fire comes down, and yet perhaps it is. Either way, there's going to be no contesting here, is there? Isn't there going to be no wondering who's going to win this battle? They're fighting against immortal saints. Clearly God is going to win this battle will be over before it begins. Christ and the saints will be victorious. Fire will come down and they shall be destroyed. This is how we, it's put in the, the book Alpis Israel. It's the fourth last paragraph of the entire book and it reads like this. 
Thus deceived, we find them enrolled under Satan, or the adversary, and encompassing the camp of the saints and the beloved city, full of savage exhortation of the expected destruction of the best of kings. But felicious will be the hopes of the rebel multitude, and dreadful the vengeance to burst upon them. The trembling earth and the blackening heavens warn them of a coming tempest. The dark vapours and thick clouds of the sky, curling in dense and lowering masses, suddenly hiss forth that forked lightning, and the heaven is rent by the deafening roar of the voice of God. Hail and fire mingled with hail pour down upon them, and they are destroyed from the face of the land. Thus God will deliver his king, for fire shall come down from God out of heaven, and shall devour them. And so we see the picture before us of this rebellion, this final ever rebellion, being put down, being crushed. Again, it links us back to Ezekiel 38, and this time it's to verse 22. And so, as we read in Zechariah 2 verse 5, God will be as a wall of fire round about Jerusalem, and the adversaries will be devoured by fire. This rebellion will be crushed. Before we move on from this, let's just consider the audacity of what is taking place here. Here the nations, they presumably are going to be forewarned. If we here are able to understand these things, living before Christ has even returned, if we've understood these things correctly, then you'd expect that during the thousand years that the nations will already know about this very rebellion. That they will be taught that at the, end of the, the, at the end of the thousand years, there's going to be a rebellion and it's going to be crushed. You'd expect them to know this, and yet, sadly, they of course won't have that faith. But we know that the nations are going to be taught the word of God. And so you'd expect them even to be forewarned. And yet, in their folly, in their madness, they are going to rise against Christ. Or well, more than this, they are fighting against God. Acts 17 tells us how God gives life, breath, all things. Our very breath is in the hands of God. In an instant, he could take it away and return back to dust. How foolish to fight against God. And yet, as we've already considered, they fought against the Son of God and put him to death. In his second coming, they'll fight against him and try, and this time they will be put to death. And it's going to happen again at the end of the thousand years. Nothing changes in some ways. And how shall this be? Well, you'd think it would be amazing that anyone would try and fight against an immortal. But as we've already considered in those days, people will be living, it seems, for hundreds of years. And when you yourself are living for hundreds of years, perhaps whether or not the saints are actually immortal becomes a matter of faith. And these people clearly do not have that faith. And so they will fight against immortals and very badly lose. Well, the third point is just how ungrateful this is, considering God has given us everything we have, considering how they will have lived through the blessedness, the glories of the kingdom age, and a, a righteous rulership, knowing the truth, seeing the earth beautified, living in a society that is completely at peace, the wonders and the plenty and the food and everything that they have, and yet they are ungrateful, and they turn and they rebel. Well, this teaches us a great lesson. It teaches us the lesson of human nature. And part of the point we want to bring out is that actually faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. These people have lived during the thousand years. They will perhaps have seen Christ himself. They will have seen miracles. They'd have seen the transformation of the entire earth. They will know that God is the creator, but they don't have faith. And yet we might at first expect that faith comes from seeing great miracles, but indeed it doesn't. Consider the children of Israel who saw the plagues upon Egypt, the wonders in the wilderness, and yet so many of them perished for lack of faith. Consider those who saw the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They saw his compassion, his, his lovely character, and they put him to death. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And so if we want to have faith, 
We need to turn to the word. We need to fill ourselves with the word, the light of God's word. And the other lesson it teaches us is that need to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. Human nature doesn't change. And the very fact that they rebel against such a wonderful leadership shows you what we are capable of. It shows you what human nature is like. You know, it can perhaps be easy for us to look around, to, to look at our neighbours and see people in the world and say, well, actually, they, they seem to be lovely people, very nice people. And yet, if you were a Jew living in Germany a hundred years ago, if you were a Jew living at that time, you perhaps looked at your neighbour and you thought, here's a, here's a lovely person, they're really nice. And as the years go by and things begin to change and the Nazis come into power, all of a sudden that lovely chap next door is selling you to a concentration camp. We see the tragedy, the awfulness of how humans actually can behave. And perhaps the best example of this again is the very fact of the Lord Jesus Christ who went about healing and teaching and showing such love and compassion and trying to help people towards the kingdom and they crucified him. And so truly God is right that our nature has to be dealt with. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ himself, although sinless, he still crucified the flesh. He was still tempted like we are until he put that to death and he conquered sin and God raised him up. And so we have to, we can only look to the light of God's word. We can't deceive, deceive ourselves. We have to look to God. We have to put to death our natural impulses, our natural desires. And we have to look to God instead. We are not able to save ourselves, and in fact, we wouldn't want the earth to be filled with our glory. The only light comes from God. We must look to him and to his word. And so we're just going to have a brief summary of this rebellion by coming back to Isaiah chapter 26, please. Isaiah 26 is a beautiful chapter. It begins, in that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him, him in shalom, shalom, perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in Yahweh forever, for in Yah, Yahweh is everlasting strength. And we have this beautiful picture presented to us of that righteous nation keeping the truth. And it says in verse 5 that he's going to bring down them that dwell on high, the lofty city. Here is man and his pride being humbled. Verse 6, the foot shall tread it down. We've looked at that idea of the foot taking dominion earlier in the weekend. But in verse 7, the way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Yahweh, have we waited for thee. We've seen how necessary it will be for the judgments to precede the kingdom, that that man might be humbled so that he's ready to learn, to listen to sense, that he might accept God's ways. Verse 9, with my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When God's judgments are in this earth, then the inhabitants at last will learn righteousness and then there can be peace. And so verse 10, let favour be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and so favor is going to be shown to all those living during the kingdom favor will be shown even to the wicked and yet he will not learn righteousness yea even in the land of uprightness the land of the kingdom he will still deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of Yahweh and so verse 11, Yahweh, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. And as we've seen in Revelation 20, those who live in the land of uprightness and yet continue on in their wickedness, who will not learn righteousness, they shall be devoured with the fire of God's enemies. And another interesting point that comes out from this reference in Isaiah 26 
is it perhaps exposes to us the motivation of those men which begin this rebellion. It says it's for the envy at the people in verse 11. And so perhaps it's for envy that these things happen. That nothing has changed. It's just like it was back in the beginning. The motivation would appear to be envy. And it, it reminds us of Genesis 3 verse 5. When the serpent said to the woman, how you will not surely die, ye shall be as gods. And so the woman could look and think, oh, I want to be like the gods and grasp at that. To be like the Elohim. Sadly, perhaps this is them looking at Christ and the saints and wanting to take that rulership for themselves. And the sad thing is, if they would only wait and trust in God, they could have the hope of being like the saints in the terms of being given immortal life. And so this is the same as Psalm 106. If you remember Korah's rebellion, it seems from what Moses said that Korah, although a Levite himself, he also wanted to grasp at the priesthood. He envied Moses. And as a result, a fire was kindled and the flame burned up the wicked. The same thing. And again, we see that the chief priest delivered up the Lord Jesus Christ to Pilate for envy. That's why he was put to death, because of that envy. And again, they're going to rebel against him. But this time, they're going to be destroyed with the fire of God's enemies. And so we move past the rebellion then to the final judgment. Revelation 20, after describing the rebellion, it moves on to the judgment, which we believe therefore must be talking about the final judgment that's going to take place after all these things. We're not going to spend long on this, so we're going to say we, of course, expect this is the judgment for those who lived during the millennium. That there will have been many who lived during that time. Although they're living for hundreds of years, many will have died. They need to be raised up from the dead, like at the end of Revelation 20, and they're going to be judged. We'd expect, of course, God is consistent. He doesn't change. And so the same principles for this judgment will apply to that judgment, which we've already looked at, the judgment of Christ's return. And so at the end of verse 13, we see that judged according to their works, the same as we considered that we will be judged according to our works, which will expose whether or not we have faith. And what's really wonderful about this final judgment is that once it is over, the time will come in which all the wicked will return to the dust and cease to be. They will be no more. And all those faithful from the thousand years, they shall be immortalized. And so, as it says in verse 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. How wonderful this shall be when death itself is done away with, when everyone who is left is immortal. As it says in Hosea 13, verse 14, O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. And death will be done away with. That final enemy gone. There shall be no more death at all. How wonderful. And so then we really come to the end. What's going to happen after the final judgment, when everyone has been immortalized. When we put on the screen those words of the Lord Jesus Christ, we speak that we do know. Because we can only speak those things that we know, and we seem to be given, or at least we understand very precious little about what's going to happen after the thousand years. And so absolutely, young people, I challenge you to go out and to find verses which tell us more about this. I think it can be good for us to try and imagine, try and work it out. But we have to be careful. We really want to back up what we're saying with what scripture says. As it can be so hard for us to comprehend just what living forever would be like. And so we have to be careful of applying a finite mind to those things which we should, we should do then. And so we search out the scriptures and try and find what does the scripture tell us. Well, if you come to 1 Corinthians 15, we do have a passage there which, which tells us a little about what this should be like. 
So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the, the resurrection chapter, we see here, he's talking about the resurrection in, in verse 23, about Christ being the first from the dead, and afterwards they that are his that is coming. But verse 24 says, Then cometh the end, when he, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And so Christ reigns until all those enemies are subdued. We were looking at the purpose of the thousand years. But once death is destroyed, then the Son delivers the kingdom to God. Verse 27, for he hath put all things under his feet. That's a quote from Psalm 8 verse 6. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, that God's accepted, which did put all things under Christ. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so the Lord Jesus Christ shall be reigning over the earth. As we see at the, the end, the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where it says, All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. And so all shall become subject to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be subject to God. That God at the top of this glorious hierarchy, that he shall be all in all. And how wonderful that day shall be when God is seen in everyone. This is God's purpose, isn't it? That all-important verse, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God is one. God is one. He is calling us to be of one mind with him. And ultimately even to be of one nature with him, to be of divine nature. And in that day everyone shall be one with God perfect fellowship they shall all show the glorious character of god and so we're not it seems given so much detail or perhaps it's concealed in the scriptures about what we will be doing then but we know that everyone will be like god we can consider that just during the thousand years itself there's going to be that many saints that we won't have time to really meet them all we might at first imagine we're going to be going around speaking to abraham and isaac and jacob and david and that but it's going to be so busy and there's going to be so many saints that we won't have the opportunity to speak to them or get to know them more properly during the thousand years. And then after the thousand years, there'll be all the, the, the mortals of the thousand years who are now immortalized. There'll be so many people to meet, each with their own story, their own personality. And yet meeting each one will be like meeting the Lord Jesus Christ. They will all have that character of God. We will all be in that perfect fellowship. And so perhaps partly we're not told so much detail because it's hard to understand for us, even to understand the idea of living forever. But we can be sure that there will be things unspeakable in that paradise which shall come. And more than this, if we add to that Corinthians verse, if we add John. The end of John, he seems to be just talking about what the Lord Jesus Christ did in his ministry. And he says, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Imagine how many books that it would take then to write about the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. Imagine how much there is for us to learn just about his ministry. And through the ages of eternity then, we'll continue to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, to learn about our God, to continue to meet each other and get to know each other. How wonderful that time shall be how much we have to look forward to. And so we come to some conclusions from this very fact that we seem to know very little about after the thousand years compared to the thousand years itself. It's interesting, it's like the further we try to look into the future, the less we know. We know so much about Christ's return and the actual setting up of the thousand year reign. We also know lots about the thousand years itself. And then we perhaps know a bit less about what's going to happen afterwards with the rebellion. And we don't seem to know very much at all about what's going to happen after that. And so it's like perhaps our minds are being directed to look at well, what is the next step? 
It seems that it's a thousand year reign that is set before us that should be our vision to motivate us through life now. And then perhaps once we are there, by that time we'll be immortal. And during the thousand years, we might learn more and more about what's gonna happen after the thousand years. But it seems that God has put for us the vision of the thousand years for that hope to really see ourselves there now. That's what we fill our minds with to motivate us, that we might keep strong, that we might endure the trials of this life, that we're looking to that next step. And the other conclusion is, well, in a sense, we have the hope of being made immortal. And yet, if we were asked, what are we going to be doing for the, the ages of eternity? In reality, we're not able to really say that much. We're not able to, in great detail, describe what we'll be doing forever and forever. And in the end, then, it comes down to a matter of faith. Have you ever considered if the Lord Jesus Christ was in front of you now and he offered you immortality, would you take it? I'm sure all of our natural reaction would be, yes, I want to live forever. Yes, I want to have immortality. But you'd have to stop and think for a moment. If you're going to be given immortal life, there's going to be no way out of that. You wouldn't want to spend forever and ever bored or forever and ever in a world that you do not like. And so actually it's going to take faith to want to be made immortal. There's no escape out of immortality. It goes on forever. And so only those who really want immortality will be given immortality. Those who wouldn't enjoy being in the kingdom are not going to be there. We have to have that faith to be made immortal. In a sense, perhaps it comes down to this verse here. It's those that appreciate that God's loving kindness is better than life. They will be the ones who want to be there, those that love God. They want to spend eternity with him. Those that appreciate the character of the Lord Jesus Christ and want to live in a world filled with him. Those who want to live in that perfect fellowship with their brothers and sisters glorified. And so it takes faith, doesn't it, to want to be immortalized. And I'm sure we should have that faith when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He understood these things better than any of us and he chose to endure the cross for these things. He wanted to be there and he now is immortalized. How wonderful, how glorious it will be. It gives meaning to our life. We do want to be there because we know God, because we love God. But that's the key, isn't it? This is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We come to know our God and our Lord. We come to appreciate and to love them and God's righteousness and God's ways. And we want that. And that truly would be our joy to spend eternity with our God when he is all and in all. And this earth is glorified as originally intended, full of God's glory. And so we're going to finish then by just briefly imagining what we've been considering. We're going to try and imagine what we've just looked at. And so we're going to stop sharing as we just very briefly try and project ourselves forward to that day. We're going to consider a man who's called Sim. Sim is named after his forefather Simeon. He's of the tribe of Simeon. He lives during the kingdom. In fact, he was born during the kingdom. And so this is sin. I've always lived during the millennium. I was born during this time. In fact, I love it. I love being here. I remember growing up, my parents were forever going on at me. They show, I should appreciate this time, that things weren't always like this, that we didn't always have righteous rulers. And the older I've got, the more I've come to appreciate how wonderful this is to live in the kingdom and to live in the tribe of Simeon, in the land of Israel, so close to the temple at the center of the earth, Oh, it is truly wonderful. I love going up to the temple. One of my favorite places to go is on the evening to go and sit by that river that flows forth, sit by that living water that brings healing to the earth, that's healed the Dead Sea. It is truly wonderful living in the kingdom. I remember being told when I was young that things weren't always like this, that in the past, deception used to be a ban. There's all sorts of false theories and false gods. I remember having a good laugh when I was told that apparently some used to not believe in a God at all, 
and they thought that they were descended from monkeys, like apes or octopus and stuff. And I'm not really sure whether or not to believe that, but I remember laughing when I was young. But now everyone knows about the God of Israel. Everyone knows that he is the creator. It's so wonderful to be able to talk to anyone about the truth. And yet some people are more enthusiastic than others still. And so I like going up to the temple. And as I say, going out to the shade of the tree by the river, because there, there tends to be lots of people who are really enthusiastic about the scriptures. And I love the discussions that I have. And yet we were always warned that things wouldn't always last, that a thousand years would come to an end. We were always warned that there would be a time of testing, that the saints would withdraw. And now that time has come. And things very quickly, it's very scary how quickly things changed. I remember the first time I had something stolen from me. I just didn't believe it was stolen. I thought I must have misplaced it. We never used to have doors in our locks during the thousand years, but now, or well, years ago, we installed a lock. And here we are in the house because we've heard the rumors, the rebellion growing. We've heard horrific stories, heard of friends who were sure were faithful and they've joined them and they've made their way almost to the land. What are we going to do? We've been warned at this time. I prepared for this time. I believed. I'm sure I believe. I, I really tried to prepare for this time, to prepare my family for this time. And now they're there. They're knocking on the door. They've broken it down. They're brandishing sharp implements. They're expecting that we're going to join them. We can't. We must uphold our Lord. I remember in this, uh, a year ago when I had to first stand up for the Lord. I remember what they were saying when they were trying to defame our Lord. And I had to stand up and tell him, no, he is a righteous ruler. But now can I stand up to these men? They're offering me the choice of death, following my Lord and death or joining them. I was always so sure I believed, but what am I going to choose? Now I'm being faced with losing everything or holding fast to that hope of the resurrection and the final judgment. And so then that time of the final judgment will come. That time in which all the unfaithful are no more. They've all turned back to the dust. And there is one exultant, glorious multitude with eternal life. In the twinkling of an eye, those mortals from the thousand years, those faithful, are clothed with immortality. And the earth is full with God's glory. That perfect unity and oneness. This whole glorious multitude, which love God so fervently, which love each other so much, that are so happy to spend eternity together. And so the time has come when God has wiped away all tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation.